AEW Revolution 2024 is in the books, and so too is the career for one of the all-time greats, Sting. Wrestled his final match tonight in the place where really for him it all began, the Greensboro Coliseum. It was back in 1988 that Sting and Ric Flair went toe-to-toe -to -toe in a 45-minute classic for the NWA World Heavyweight title. Sting and Ric Flair were both in the building tonight, as were Tony Schiavone and Jim Ross, who provided commentary for that match. They were on commentary for Sting's final match tonight. Good to see JR. I wasn't sure if he was going to be able to make it or not. But tonight was all about Sting. There were a lot of other things on this show tonight. There were a lot of things I can get very angry about, because I am not a fan of Bleacher Report. And I'm going to contain my anger towards Bleacher Report because it's not about BR tonight and all the BS with BR. Tonight is about Sting. And tonight is about acknowledging the fact that in Sting, we had somebody who only a few years ago, it looked like his career was over. He went to WWE, he got hurt. And WWE was never going to clear him and he was never going to be able to get the ending to his career that he wanted to have. And no wrestler wants to be dictated to as far as how your career is going to end. No, no wrestler wants to be dictated to as far as being told that, well, because of your body, because of your physical limitations, you simply are not going to be able to do what you do for a living. And then Tony Khan got in contact with Sting, or Sting may have gotten in contact with Tony Khan, but they were able to forge a relationship, and Tony Khan brought Sting into AEW, and he was able to breathe new life into Sting's career in a way that I don't think any fan really ever expected. I certainly didn't. Sting came in, and not only did he come in and have success in AEW for what was only supposed to be cinematic matches, and Sting ended up doing a hell of a lot more than cinematic matches. Sting got back in the ring, Sting found a tag team partner in Darby Allen, so he didn't have to work singles matches. And Sting all of a sudden turned into a modern day Terry Funk who would go out there and do the wackiest, most dangerous, stupid shit that you can think of that he absolutely did not have to do. But he did it anyway because he could and because he felt that he had to put on a show for all the fans. Because it matters to him. He wants people, when they buy their ticket to go see Sting, he wants to make sure he gives them their money's worth. And I can sit here now as a fan of the man and tell you that he doesn't have to worry about that. He gave the people their money's worth tonight in Greensboro. But to see the ending that Tony Khan was able to provide to him is the best thing that Tony Khan has done, really, in the last four years of AEW. When it comes to any of the talents that he has on his roster, any of the talents, the many, many, many talents that he employs, the thing that I appreciate the most is how Sting has been treated. We have seen legends treated not nearly as well as Sting has been treated in other places. Sting was able to come in and do tonight what I think a lot of people were hoping to see. Get through the match, not get hurt, and go out on top in a blaze of glory. And that is exactly what Sting did. Not only did Sting go in there tonight, but he won. He won. And he walks out undefeated, and he walks out as one half of the AEW World Tag Team Champions. He gets to retire undefeated as a champion in this company. I didn't think that was going to happen. I thought he was going to go out on his back. I thought he was going to go out and do the honors, right? The old school way of doing it. I hope they convinced him to uh, do it the other way, because I'm sure they wanted Sting to go out undefeated. I'm sure Tony Khan wanted him to go out undefeated. And I'm glad that he did. And I can't say enough good things about the send-off they gave this man tonight. I would dare anybody to show me a better send-off, a better final match, especially for someone like Sting with as much equity as he has in wrestling. This was the best send-off that I have ever seen for anybody. I mean, you could not have envisioned this any more perfectly. Now, of course, you can nitpick and talk about Glass being involved in some of the stupid shit they did during the match. Uh, but nonetheless. This was perfect, and that was the highlight of the entire show. Uh, we unfortunately ended, though, with the very abrupt 
conclusion to Sting's retirement speech. If I had one thing that I would change about this, it was the fact that, unfortunately, they ran out of pay-per-view time, and in the middle of Sting's speech, they put the copyright up, and they faded to black. So we did not get to see the entire thing. Now, I'm sure AEW is going to post the entire thing on their YouTube channel if it isn't already up by now. I'm sure we'll get to see it. Uh, so that was the only real uh, knock against it. But uh, we ended up with two early match of the year contenders on this show. That main event with Sting and Darby against the Young Bucks, which I'm going to have a lot more to say about that later. And also the, I guess we could say official AEW debut, at least since he signed his contract of Will Ospreay, one-on-one -on -one with Kanosuke Takeshita. Those were the two matches I was most looking forward to coming into the show, the main event and the Ospreay match. And those two matches knocked it out of the fucking park. Ospreay and Takeshita went out there tonight. They tore down the house in Greensboro, and they showed why they are part, a very big part, of AEW's future going forward. Will Ospreay is going to be the face of AEW. As we see Sting take his final bow and ride off into the sunset like the, gun, the old gunslinger. Will Ospreay comes in. He takes over. Now he takes over the mantle. He will be the face of AEW before this year is over. He will be AEW world champion guaranteed. But whether he's champion in 2024 or he's champion in 2025, it doesn't matter. This man will be your top baby face before this year is out. And tonight he showed why his investment, Tony Khan's investment in Will Ospreay is going to pay dividends for him. Because that was a huge get for Tony Khan in his first match. That was his first match, technically, as a full-time AEW performer, his first match. And he went out there tonight and had one of the best fucking matches you'll ever see with Takeshita. So those two matches sold the entire show for me. Unfortunately, there were parts of the opening matches that I did not get to see. Uh, because I, like I know a number of people, not everybody, but there were a number of people who had issues with Bleacher Report. By the way, fuck Bleacher Report. I didn't think, I didn't think there was a possible way that Peacock could be turned babyface. After the issues I had with Peacock, right, we talked about that. This is going to be the new thing now, Solomonster against technology. That's going to be a new segment here on these streams. I didn't think that there would be, a, a day would come where I would be begging for Peacock to be on my screen, but tonight was that night. So unfortunately, I missed part of the show early on, but I did get to see the stuff that I wanted to see. But uh, yes, fuck Bleacher Report. And Tony Khan, I don't care what he has to do. Tony Khan needs to do whatever within his power, whatever he can do to get AEW a streaming deal as soon as possible so they can get the fuck off Bleacher Report, get on Max, get, I don't, work out a deal to get them on Peacock. <laughs> I don't give a shit. Work out some kind of a, a sharing arrangement. Is that possible with WWE? Probably not. Holy shit. But again, this is about Sting. There was actually an announcement, uh, an important announcement tonight. Uh, we've talked about AEW adding more pay-per-views in the future. And we found out tonight the name of one of those new pay-per-views is going to be AEW Dynasty. In fact, I just got done talking about this on the podcast earlier today. Now it is official. AEW Dynasty is coming to St. Louis, Missouri on Sunday, April 21st. So Double or Nothing is not going to be the next pay-per-view. It will be Dynasty, and then uh, Double or Nothing will be the month after. By the way, AEW put together this uh, tremendous little uh, montage, this graphic here that you see on your screen, the evolution of Sting, all the different incarnations of Sting from over the year. How cool is that? This is just a visual illustration here. You, you look at this and you see just all the years and the generations that this man's career has spanned. And it's just incredible to see him from where he started to where he is now still going. Yes, he's older and slower, but the fact that he's even able to go out there uh, and do the things that we saw him doing in the ring tonight. And they, they were very careful to protect him. That's why, you know, the Bucks were the perfect opponents and all the people that poo-pooed the idea of the Young Bucks being Sting's final opponent, uh, those people have egg on their face now because I thought the Young Bucks did a fucking tremendous job in that tag team match tonight. And they put Sting over, too, at the very end of it all. So, two thumbs up for them as well. But this is your AEW Dynamite. Not Dynamite. Revolution. What am I talking about? It's AEW Revolution. This is the best damn episode of Dynamite I ever saw. AEW Revolution. It's late. 
It's late. Come on now. It's one o'clock in the morning. Cut me some slack. I am the Solomon. Monster. Like and subscribe. Super chats are open. I will try to get you out of here as quickly as I can. I know it's late. Not, not as late if you're on the uh, West Coast as it is here on the East Coast. But uh, nonetheless. So like and subscribe. Super chats are open. Uh, you will see them popping up on screen as soon as I unpause them. So there you go. <laughs> I'll pause them from time to time. Don't get alarmed. Uh, and if you did miss it, since I mentioned it before, uh, a brand new two hour plus episode of the Solomonster Sounds Off went up earlier today, episode 851, not only talking Sting and Revolution, but talking a lot of other stuff as well. So be sure tomorrow uh, to go ahead and check that out on your commute or if you're working from home, if you're at the gym, wherever it may be, that will be there for you. Now, let's start with this pre-show. We'll get through this quickly because they had two pre-show matches on the uh, Zero Hour pre-show. Uh, it was the first of two matches tonight to get basically as many people on the show as possible. And the pre-show was fine because the pre-show, I had no issues with the pre-show. The issues came once the actual pay-per-view started. But we had Jay White, The Guns, The Acclaimed, and Billy Gunn taking on Jeff Jarrett, Jay Lethal, Satnam Singh, Willie Mack, and Private Party. Max Caster, he messed up his rap for the second time. Yes, that's right. That's, that's the music that Max Caster heard in his ear when he messed up his rap again. Uh, except he really didn't because it's obvious that he's doing it on purpose now. And Jeff Jarrett dropped to his knees in the ring when he heard him fuck up his rap and he was laughing hysterically. Uh, my hope, here's my hope. My hope is that him completely Continuing to fuck up these raps will eventually lead to him turning against Bullet Club Gold because he will blame them in some roundabout way. And we can get the split. Because I hate this bang bang scissor gang nonsense. So maybe it will actually, something good will come out of this. And maybe it will lead to a fracture between the two groups. Late in the match, uh, Billy went for a Famouser on Willie Mack. Satnam Singh, he uh, grabbed his foot from the floor. And the heels hit a series of moves on Billy, Willie, Billy and Willie, yes, Billy and Willie were in this match. <laughs> uh, he went for a frog splash, Billy avoided it, and Jay White tagged into the match. And there was a whole bunch of, you know, back and forth moves. The 310 to Yuma took out Isaiah Cassidy, Mark Quinn tried to get involved, and Caster and Bowens hit him with the arrival and the mic drop, respectively. Uh, anyway, I'm skipping ahead here because we don't need to get into the weeds. At the end of all this, Jay White picked up the win for his team. And that really is the most important takeaway from this. The fact that Jay White was the one to uh, get the W for his team. When the match was over, he took the bike and said Greensboro is one of his favorite cities in the world. Hyped up the crowd about Will Ospreay being in action on the show in Sting's final match. He said his faction is the greatest faction in professional wrestling. He said the faction is led by one of the greatest of all time, and he said that he could remind everyone at any moment that he is the catalyst of pro wrestling, and he said that he might handle some big business of his own in 10 days. So they've got big business coming up in Boston on March 13th. He's teasing a big match on that show. I don't know exactly what that means, although there are rumors of Okada making his debut on Dynamite this week. Would they set up an Okada J White match for big business? It's possible. I don't know exactly who he's referring to, but it's good to see them planning something with Jay White. Not not Bullet Club or the acclaimed Jay White, who has not really been involved in anything of any great note since he lost to MJF at full gear. It's good to get him back in the rotation here, and hopefully whatever they have planned for him in Boston is big because I want to see him featured more and not part of this clown show. Tony Schiavone interviewed David Crockett at ringside. They had a lot of uh, guests of honor with Sting's retirement tonight. David Crockett was one of them. And for the people wondering, by the way, because there were a couple of people who asked me before about Lex Luger, he was there. He was not, I don't think they showed him on camera unless I missed it, uh, which is possible because I missed parts of this show for obvious reasons. But he was there because I know there were fan videos popping up on social media of him being wheeled or around the crowd in his wheelchair. So he was there. I think DDP was there. Uh, there were a whole bunch of people there. But 
the reason I bring this up is Tony Schiavone is interviewing David Crockett. And David Crockett referred to the Young Bucks in this interview as the Young Blucks. And I died. I died and I came back to life. The Young Blucks. I so want to call them that from now on. I'll probably forget, but I like that. The Young Blucks, according to David Crockett. And people said David Crockett was a terrible wrestling announcer. I can't imagine why. Chris Statlander and Willow Nightingale. They had Stokely Hathaway with them. He did commentary for the match. But they took on Julia Hart and Sky Blue. Uh, For the finish here, Willow avoided a code blue, and she launched Sky Blue into orbit with a pounce and knocked this girl out of the ring. Statlander threw her back inside, and Nightingale hit a doctor bomb for the win. So it was good. It was a good tag match, and I assume this sets up Willow now for a TBS title match soon with Julia Hart. We also got a return vignette. For Pac, I had completely forgotten about Pac. I feel like he has missed more time in AEW than he's actually been on TV during the period of time that he has been under contract to this company. Whether it's injuries, whether it's visa issues, whatever it is, I completely forgot about him. And Pac is great. So I'm glad that we're getting him back soon. He said it was none of our business where he's been. He told Tony Khan that he would never get rid of him. He said that he would be back very soon and would be dragging this festering scrotum of a company into a new age. A festering scrotum of a company. That's a new one. He's been gone since July of last year. If you remember the last time we saw him in a match, evidently he got hurt during the match. I remember, I couldn't figure out where he got hurt. I remember hearing that he got hurt in that match with Gravity, on television, I, re- I watched it back. I said, I have no idea what the injury is. I don't think it's ever been reported what the injury was. So he's been out since July. So it'll be good to get him back. So now we get to the main card. And I will say this. This show was... Uh, I, one thing I loved about the visuals of this show... Well, actually, there's two things I want to point out. Number one, it was very well lit. And that doesn't sound necessarily like a big deal, but it is. Uh, I thought it visually looked great. Now, of course, it's well lit because they had 16,000 people in the building. AEW doesn't get 16,000 people in the building very often. Certainly not for weekly TV. They, they struggle to get half that for their weekly TV, if that. And they run smaller venues now because they have to, because they have attendance problems in a lot of cities. This show in particular nearly sold out weeks ago. They've had 15,000, 16,000 tickets moved for weeks. And it's because of one man. It's because of one attraction. The final match of Sting. So people came out in support of Sting. You had a lot of people in the building, and so they lit it up. And so on the hard cam, you looked at it, you had people like, yeah, that's right, they were hanging from the rafters. So it looked great. One other thing I noticed, and they did this during, um, it might have been one of the matches on the pre-show, I don't remember. But it reminded me of something that we've seen from the new head of production in WWE. They did this shot where they had a camera. And we get one shot of the camera coming down the rampway during a match. And you see, and it gets closer to the ring, and it's just one continuous shot. And I saw that on Raw. Might have been last week. It was during the, there was like a tag match with Miz and DIY. And they did it tonight, too. And I think that's great, because I just think visually it's such a cool shot. So it's just funny, I I just remember seeing that on WWE television, and then boom, there it is on AEW television. Uh, But the main card kicked off with the TNT Championship match between Christian Cage and Daniel Garcia. I missed most of this match, pretty much almost the entire match, because Bleacher Report is fucking garbage. In case I didn't mention that before, Bleacher Report fucking sucks. Uh, So I missed, unfortunately the majority of this match. Eventually, I found a a different way to watch this show uh, on my phone. The reason I was able to watch this pay-per-view the rest of the way is because I watched it on my iPhone. And no, I don't have one of these Max iPhones that are gigantic. So it's better than nothing. (laughs) While all of you people were watching this pay-per-view on a nice big flat screen TV, probably, Uh, I had my trusty iPhone, but at least I was able to watch the show. 
And I picked up with the match at the very end, just in time to see Matt Menard brawling with Killswitch to the back. Christian tried for a spear on Garcia. His leg gave out. I would have to assume because Garcia was working on Christian's leg, right? That would be the natural assumption if you did not see the first half of this match. And Garcia hit a snap pile driver for a close two count. He hit a jackknife pin. Cage, though, got a rope break. And then Mother Wayne. She took Aubrey Edwards for the distraction while her offspring, Nick Wayne, flew in with a cutter and Christian then hit the kill switch to win the match and to retain the title. I was a little surprised uh, because I thought that we would see Adam Copeland make an appearance. I thought Copeland would end up costing Christian for what he did to him a few weeks ago. He would cost him the TNT title. I thought they would put the belt on Garcia who's been getting over more and more uh, ever since the Continental Classic. And so I thought they'd elevate him by putting the belt on him, and Copeland and Christian then can go off and continue their feud, and it doesn't really need the TNT title. And then they can have their blow-off match at Double or Nothing. Of course, now we know there's a pay-per-view first, so they can do their blow-off at Dynasty if they want to. Uh, but there was no Copeland, and it was the typical patriarchy distraction. And Christian, and I, look, I love Christian Cage, so I'm not upset that he's still the champion. It just surprised me because I thought we might get a title change. So I guess that means they're going to save the TNT title for Adam Copeland, who doesn't really need it, but I guess that's what they're going to do. Uh, was DDP there? He, they didn't show him, but yeah, he was supposed to be there. So I don't see why he wouldn't have been there. Luger was there too. He just wasn't shown. We had Eddie Kingston against Brian Danielson for the Continental Championship. If Eddie wins, the stipulation is that Brian Danielson must shake his hand. Uh, I kept having blackouts, and I don't mean me like I was fucking drunk. I mean my feed. I kept having blackouts uh, throughout parts of this match, so I'm going to give you the best review I possibly can. Uh, it had a big fight feel to it. I know that. And there were dueling chants for both men, a lot of chops, and they ended up on the apron. Kingston ended up chopping the ring post by accident. Danielson hit a suplex off the apron to the floor. Eddie drove him down with a DDT before locking in the stretch plum, and his arm was hurt, so Danielson was able to escape fairly easily. Uh, Danielson avoided a half and half and hit a series of corner drop kicks. Kingston sidestepped the third one, so Danielson planted him with a dragon suplex for two. And back and forth we went between these two. Just a lot of uh, a lot of mat wrestling and some stiff shots here from these two. Eventually, Danielson locked on the triangle. Uh, and the significance of that is that was the move that he used to put Eddie to sleep in the six-man tag on Wednesday. So he put the move back on again. Kingston faded, but this time he raised his hand up and he got the ropes. Both men traded half and half suplexes before collapsing. And the fans gave them a big ovation. I think it was a standing ovation uh, that they got from the fans here in Greensboro, which was hot all night. I mean, obviously they were there to see Sting, but kudos to the crowd in Greensboro. 16,000 people were going nuts for almost everything on the entire show. So both men got to their feet. They were swinging wildly with slaps until Danielson backdropped out of a power bomb. He tried another Busaiku knee after one earlier. Kingston hit a lariat, and then he beat him with a power bomb. A very simple power bomb with a high stack in the cover. He got the three, and Eddie retains the Continental title. And so, as per the stipulation, Brian Danielson would have to shake this man's hand. And he don't like Eddie Kingston. So would he shake his hand or would he not shake his hand? He faked it at first, like he put his hand out, then he pulled back. Eddie was going to go leave, and Danielson smiled. He goes, no, 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 no. And he put his hand out, and Eddie put his hand out. They shook hands. Danielson raised his arm, and he paid respect to the champion. And then Danielson, if you didn't notice, he fell out of the ring. Uh, as he was going to jump off the apron, he tripped, and he landed on his feet. Probably a little embarrassed, but he smiled. He kind of he laughed, said something to the security guy. At first, I was like, is he okay? Because we have dealt with a lot of just freak injuries in this company, right? The Adam Cole thing. Just freak injuries in wrestling in general of late. I was half expecting to get the, the update midway through the pay-per-view that he tore his ACL. But thankfully, 
he's okay. Uh, what I saw of the match, which was the majority of it, again, I missed some parts early, but what I saw of the match I thought was tremendous. Uh, just a stiff back and forth between these two, some great wrestling. And Eddie finally earning the respect of the man who had no respect for him coming into this match. I can't say that it was better than either of the matches they had earlier uh, in the Continental Classic just because I didn't, there were parts I didn't see. I missed chunks of this match. Uh, but I expected this to be excellent, and that's exactly what it was. And to add to the story, and this is not anything that aired on the pay-per-view, but they posted a social media video uh, from the trainer's room after the match. And it was long. It was about a little over three minutes. And it was Danielson sitting there being tended to by the trainer. He had an ice pack, I think, on his shoulder. Eddie was also there with an ice pack. And Eddie Kingston was just talking about how, look, it's great that I get respect from the fans and people you know, like me and cheer for me. And he's talking about all this stuff. He goes, but the most important thing to him is the respect of his peers, the respect of the other wrestlers, of the boys. That is what means the most to him. And so for Brian Danielson to go out there tonight and shake his hand meant more to him than anything else. Like he was really putting him over. And then he shook his hand, Eddie left, Danielson was there by himself, and Danielson proceeded to just look into the camera, and he talked for two and a half minutes and cut a promo, and he talked about the fact that, you know, it's, it's his fault that he didn't see in Eddie Kingston what he sees now. And he was really putting him over and paying respect to him and talking about, he had a smile on his face that you could not remove surgically. Like, this is what this guy lives for. Like, he's enjoying the hell out of this, this last little stretch that he has as a full-time performer, you could tell. Uh, because this is right up his alley. This is what he this is what he loves. Uh, so it's a great little promo if you have time to find it. Again, it's about three minutes long. I don't know if it's up on their YouTube channel, but they posted it on their Twitter uh, during the show. We had the All Star Scramble with Wardlow, Powerhouse Hobbs, Lance Archer, Chris Jericho, Brian Cage, Dante Martin, Hook, and Magnus. Not Nick Aldis. Magnus from CMLL. Taz uh, joined on commentary for this, and uh, Nigel McGinnis tagged out, which made sense because Hook was in this match. Not only was Hook in this match, but there were a couple of old Team Taz members in this match as well. Uh, you had Brian Cage in there, you had Will Hobbs in there, so it made sense for Taz to uh, be on commentary for this. We got the uh, previously announced Meet Madness right at the beginning here, because Originally, they were going to have Meat Madness, which was basically just going to be a match with a bunch of big guys beating the hell out of each other. And the only three names they announced for it that they advertised were Wardlow, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Lance Archer. And then we found out a few days ago that Tony Khan was pulling Meat Madness because there were certain people who were not medically cleared. And I thought, well, who's hurt? Well, it's not Wardlow, it's not Hobbs, and it's not Archer. Apparently, he wanted other people, Miro and Keith Lee and other people to be a part of Meat Madness and they're hurt and they can't be, so he's put that back in the meat locker and he will thaw it out when those men are healthy again. So he just took those three and he tacked on five more names. And it was just a way to get a bunch of people on the show who otherwise would not have had a role on the show. <laughs> Chris Jericho. So yes, so that's how they got these people on the show. But we did get Meat Madness at first. Archer, Wardlow, Cage, and Hobbs squared off. And they wiped everybody else out. We had a little four-way pose down with these guys. Uh, we had Chance of Meat from the crowd. Archer walked the top rope into a moonsault. Tried to do the same thing to Will Hobbs. Hobbs caught him, though, and dropped him with a spine buster. Cage, Brian Cage, flew in with a Death Valley driver before Wardlow hit a step-up Hurricane Rana. Jericho jumped in with a code breaker out of nowhere, and Hook broke up the pin. Hobbs mowed people down. He dropped Archer with a running power slam, and Wardlow took turns hitting German suplexes on people. He tried for a power bomb on Brian Cage, but Hook sank in red rum. And with Wardlow fading, he was trapped in red rum. Here comes Chris Jericho. And he locks Wardlow in the walls of Jericho. 
So now we have dueling submissions on Wardlow at the same time, but Cage broke it up. Hook hit a Northern Lights on Jericho for two. He got pulled outside by Hobbs. Hobbs charged at Jericho, who sprayed... I thought it was a fire extinguisher. Apparently, it was a fog machine. Yes, a fog machine. He sprayed him in the face with it. Back inside, Cage spun out of a powerbomb, got leveled by a wind-up lariat by Wardlow. And Wardlow hit the powerbomb. Dante Martin, though, nearly stole it with a roll-up. And then Dante got clobbered in midair by Wardlow. And then he got killed with a last ride powerbomb for the win. Wardlow wins the All-Star Scramble. And oh, by the way, the winner of the All-Star Scramble earns a future AEW World Heavyweight Championship match. This was a chaotic match. There were a few fun spots. Uh, the right man went over. If they had Meat Madness, Wardlow had to win. And just because they added five more people to the match, did not change the fact that after the uh, promo that Wardlow cut on Dynamite last week, which was a hell of a promo, that he should not have come in here and won this match. He absolutely should have won. It was the right decision to put him over. It would have been the same result either way. And now Wardlow has an AEW World title match in his back pocket. And the question is, we don't know, unless Tony Khan announced it at the post-show scrum, I have not checked. But we don't yet know when he is going to get that title match. Is it going to be on TV this week? Is he going to hold on to it, almost like a money in the bank situation, and he'll he'll cash it in when he feels he's ready to? I mean, he may have to give notice, but you know he could hold on to it for a while. We don't know. But that makes me think, if he is going to hold on to it for a little while, it would make sense if he gets an AEW World title match and MJF returns and costs him the championship. Because the last we saw MJF, he was put out, right? Put to sleep by Samoa Joe. But it was Adam Cole who turned against him. It was the Undisputed Kingdom that laid a beatdown on him. And so whenever MJF is ready to come back, right? He's going to want revenge on the Undisputed Kingdom, of which Wardlow is a member. So it would only make sense. Plus, Wardlow was the one who was terrorizing him last we saw the, the two of them together. Remember they had that little confrontation in the hallway on TV one week? So I have a feeling that eventually, if they wait long enough, unless they just blow through it this week, if they wait long enough, I think MJF may be the one to cost him that title match when he eventually gets it. Because really, if you think about it right now, for him to cash in on Samoa Joe, you do Wardlow and Joe, two heels, doesn't really make sense. It would make more sense if, let's say, Joe dropped the belt to swerve at Dynasty or Double or Nothing, and then at some point in the summer, because MJF may not be ready to come back for a while, sometime in the summer, maybe then he cashes, quote-unquote, cashes in uh, for his title shot, and then MJF comes back. Again, I can visualize it all in my head. We had Orange Cassidy against Roderick Strong for the AEW International Championship. Could the Undisputed Kingdom carry the momentum from the previous match into this match here? Could they get back-to-back -back wins on this show? Cassidy came in with his ribs all taped up. He's, he was all beat up. It's the same story with him. The first international title run, it was the same thing, right? I'm so tired. I'm so beat up. He would show up on television every week. He'd have body parts taped up. He would look like the fucking Yeti from WCW. Then it's the same thing here, where he's accepting all comers, all challengers. And so he comes into the match at less than 100%. And there was a segment on the pre-show where I think he told best friends, I'm tired of my friends getting beaten up and attacked. I want you guys to stay in the back. So there was no backup out here for Orange Cassidy. He was all by himself. Roddy missed a sick kick and the end of heartache early. Cassidy got a couple of near falls. Roddy hit a pendulum backbreaker before going outside. He hit one on the barricade. Cassidy fought back with a tope and a crossbody off the top. Uh, but with the bad ribs, there was a little bit of a delay. That allowed Roddy to regain the advantage. And Roderick Strong is known for his backbreakers. And so in this match, <laughs> they were on full display because he was punishing this man with backbreakers and then they were on the ropes i think roddy was on the middle rope cassidy was on top and he had a gut wrench backbreaker on the top turnbuckle but it was almost like 
kind of like a glancing blow almost where the lower part of Cassidy's back or ribs connected with the top turnbuckle, but it folded him up on the way down and he had a really nasty landing where he almost landed on his head. I'm trying to describe it, but it looked absolutely fucking vicious. And the announcer sold it like, all right, that's it. This guy's dead. And Cassidy rolled out to the floor and he was writhing. I mean, this was brutal. And by the way, that was not the only time we would see a spot like that. There was one that may have, may have topped this in the Takeshita match. We'll get to that. Roddy connected on a rib breaker. Cassidy hit a desperation stun dog millionaire. Was not able to follow up. Roddy locked on the stronghold. Cassidy got to the ropes. Strong caught a boot and he planted Cassidy with another backbreaker before getting the stronghold applied again. And Cassidy was able to kick out. He hit the round the world DDT, went up top and hit the diving DDT, only got two. He connected with the Panama Sunrise, got a close near fall out of it, and then Roddy countered an orange punch into another backbreaker. And then hit a rising knee. Cassidy exploded out with an orange punch and a beach break, but Roddy got the ropes. Cassidy took too long to go for another orange punch, and Roddy fired up with a knee strike and then hit the end of heartache, and he got the pin to win the international title. Uh, good match with Cassidy taking a ton of punishment on some of those suplexes and those backbreakers. Uh, there was no other way. And I said it coming into this uh, pay-per-view. I said it earlier today when I did my predict the final predictions for the show. I said, if Roderick Strong, on behalf of the Undisputed Kingdom, goes into this match and can't beat a half-dead Orange Cassidy and bring the international title into the faction, into the family, then just disband the entire fucking group. This group has already been on life support ever since World's End. That would have been the death knell for this group. So, at a bare minimum, he needed to go in there and win that title, and that's exactly what he did. I'm not going to give Tony Khan credit for that. That was the obvious finish here. So Roderick Strong is the new international champion, because to have any shred of credibility, it could be no other way. So as he and Matt Taven and Mike Bennett are celebrating, in the ring, a returning Kyle O'Reilly shows up. And it took me a, a few seconds because I didn't recognize at first who it was because now he's got long hair. I think that might be the first time in his career that I can remember that he's got long hair down to his shoulders. And so he's standing in the ring and he locks eyes with Roderick Strong and they come together and they hug, they embrace, and everybody cheers. So then Mike Bennett takes his Undisputed Kingdom t-shirt off and he gives it to Kyle and Kyle refuses to put the shirt on and he walks back over to Roddy and he whispers something in Roddy's ear. Probably asking him to step aside so that he can challenge Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. And then Kyle left the ring. He gave Roddy something to think about, I guess. He just walked out. And that was the last that we saw of him here on this show. I am very happy to see Kyle O'Reilly back. I don't know if you've been following his story or his social media. He's been out for almost two years. The last time we saw Kyle O'Reilly in a match was in June of 2022. And he had neck issue. I think he had neck surgery. He might have had fusion surgery. I don't remember the exact nature of the surgery. Uh, but there were complications, and he had no use of his arm for a while, no strength in his arm, and it was looking dicey whether or not he would ever be able to come back or not. And so for him to be back now is uh, you know, very cool to see. I'm very happy for him. And now you know, we have to wait and see where his loyalty lies, right? It's a lot more interesting than him just coming back and joining the Undisputed Kingdom. You know, The fact that he didn't just rip up the shirt and beat them all up, right? He embraced Roderick Strong. He said something to him, but he didn't put the shirt on, and he didn't really even acknowledge the other two goofballs in the ring with him. So now we have to wait and see exactly where the story is going. Right? But does he have a loyalty to Roddy, but not to Adam Cole? I don't know. Maybe uh, he wants a shot at the international title, right? He's going to have to earn his way into contention first. Because remember, AEW has rankings now. so. If you've got to stick to the rankings, he's got to start winning some matches, and then he can work his way up to become number one contender for the title. But uh, very, very happy to see him back. 
And by the way, welcome to everybody joining very late here, live on YouTube for the Revolution Review. I am very happy that you are with me here. It is very late, so uh, we're trying to get through this, but it's an AEW pay-per-view, so what else do you expect, right? You know these shows aren't going to end until midnight. That's just the way it goes. John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli representing the Blackpool Combat Club taking on Dax Harwood and Cash Wheeler of FTR. Moxley and Claudio, they entered through the crowd wearing Road Warriors-inspired spiked shoulder pads as an homage to Hawk and Animal here in Greensboro. There were dueling chants for FTR and BCC early on. Moxley and Claudio, they came out and these two teams went at it right away. We had a stiff uppercut and chop exchange between the two that led to uh, Harwood. And I think it was Harwood and Moxley collapsing. They tagged in their partners. And so they really, it was basically some gamesmanship here. There wasn't really one team that was in control in the early going. But eventually Wheeler got isolated until finally Dax made the hot tag. And he ran wild with chops and lariats. Uh, we had Wheeler made the tag back into the match. Harwood was posted by Claudio and leveled Wheeler with a lariat for two. And then Dax came up bleeding. And I didn't see what it was, but he came up and he was... It only got worse as the match went on, as far as the amount of blood, but he was all bloody. He still made a blind tag, though. Claudio was up in a powerbomb position, but uh, hit a power slam in midair on Harwood. And the BCC hit an assisted air raid crash for two. Harwood, who now at this point was wearing the crimson mask, got to his feet for a slugfest with Moxley, who ran into a pop-up power bomb. FTR connected with a spike pile driver. Wheeler wiped out Claudio with a dive. Moxley, meanwhile, kicked out at two. So Claudio put a stop to the powerplex attempt by FTR. And he and Moxley connected on a, an uppercut doomsday device. Only got a two count. All four men slugged out until Moxley was sent outside, leaving Claudio to block a shatter machine into a giant swing. And Moxley hit a drop kick in mid-revolution. Here at Revolution. Apparently, they po did they post his uh, full segment? They did. Okay. Well, I told you they probably would. So apparently, Sting's full... Uh, speech is up on their YouTube channel, which I look forward to watching. I knew they would put it up there. It still sucks that they, you know, the, the, the actual pay-per-view cut off in mid-speech, but, you know. I, you know what? In a way, it's kind of perfect if you think about it, because it's very WCW-esque for something like that to happen. How many times did they go off the air, like running out of time at the end of a Nitro? Or even a pay-per-view, right? Remember uh, Halloween Havoc back in 98? There were a lot of people that missed the actual main event of that show. They didn't get to see Goldberg and DDP because Hogan and Warrior stuck, stunk out the joint. So it's kind of appropriate and fitting that Sting's retirement speech would be cut off like that. Very WCWS. Shout out to Aaron, by the way, who just gifted five channel memberships. Shout out to Aaron, who also dropped a, uh, a super chat, I believe. And I, I'll put them on pause for a second. We'll get that on pause here in a minute. But let's finish this here. Moxley had Harwood on the top rope. And he started biting at the bloody wound. Because of course he did. He started biting at the bloody wound on Dax's head. Dax in turn spat right in his face. Probably a good mix of uh, blood and saliva. Right in Moxley's face. I'm sure he bathed in it tonight. Because that feels like something John Moxley would do. That led to a powerbomb diving clothesline combo. Moxley got dropped after that with a shatter machine. Claudio pulled Harwood out of the ring at two. Wheeler tried to dive, and as he dove through the ropes, Claudio met him with an uppercut and took him out of the equation, and then he hit a neutralizer on the floor. And Harwood laid out Claudio with a pile driver. Back inside, Moxley hit Death Rider. Harwood kicked out. And Moxley ended up getting the bulldog choke applied at the same time that Claudio got the rear naked choke applied to Cash. And Dax went out. Referee called for the bell. And it's a win for the Blackpool Combat Club. Uh, so FTR did not tap out. They passed out. 
Uh, a very physical match. The crowd was on the quieter side for the first half. And then it felt like once uh, people saw Dax with blood on his face, things kind of picked up and kicked into that next gear. Uh, and then they were a lot more into the second half vocally than they were uh, the first half. I figured the Blackpool Combat Club was winning uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're the ones that are actively feuding with the CMLL guys, which is kind of a big thing in AEW right now, right? The CMLL invaders. And now they're sending the Blackpool guys to Arena Mexico in a few weeks to wrestle the CMLL stars. So I figured they would want to keep these guys looking strong. But the other reason is that uh, Cash... Uh, is going to be, I think he has a court date in May on that aggravated assault charge in Florida. And who knows how that's going to turn out. I mean, that was a case from last year, and we didn't know. I mean, I just assumed that they were going to, you know, he was going to pay a fine and that would be the end of it. But the prosecutors there decided to pursue charges. And so he's got a court date coming up in May. Who knows what that might lead to. Uh, you know, not that he's going to end up behind bars necessarily, but... It could take him out of the equation if he's got to deal with some legal issues. And so for all those reasons, I just figured FTR is going to be, you know, looking up at the lights tonight. And that's exactly what happened. We had timeless Tony Storm, one-on-one -on -one with Deanna Perrazzo for the AEW Women's World Championship. It's the amazing Goonthar. And we are joined by Goonthar. Jerry Lawler loves Goonthar, the magnificent... All hail Goonthar. Oh my goodness, it is Goonthar joining us here late on a, well, I guess Monday morning, right? It would be Monday morning. Hey, Aaron, thank you for the $50 super chat. Wow. Aaron in the top spot tonight, plus those gifted memberships. Aaron, thank you very much. I know everybody else in the chat is thanking you. I will thank you as well. Thank you. Now, I got to talk about this entrance here. Right, so we have the women's world title matches on tap. And they play Tony Storm's old theme music, that rock music that she used to come out to in AEW. And then out comes what appears to be Tony Storm. So it looks like she's for one night, she's ditched the Hollywood starlet gimmick and she's going old school and coming out as like punk rocker Tony Storm. And then I'm looking and I'm like, it took me a while before I realized that ain't Tony Storm. That's Mariah May. Like, I couldn't believe how much like Tony Storm she looked. Like, until they got like that extreme, like close up of her face, even then it took me a few seconds for my brain to process that that was not Tony Storm. So they fooled me. I don't know about you, but they fooled me. That was a, a nice little swerve there. I mean, she was a dead ringer. Here's the other thing I loved about this. So once the announcers acknowledge, wait, that's Mariah May, then they play Timeless Tony Storm's music, and the screen went black and white, and she came out, and she went over to Mariah May, and I don't know if she gave her a kiss or just a hug, whatever it was, but she acknowledged her. But what's funny to me about that is how often do we see Tony Storm even acknowledge Mariah May on television week to week? The one time she actually acknowledges her, it's because she's dressed up like her. <laughs> so, of course, she's very happy. It's like she's hugging and kissing herself. I'm sure there are some people in the live chat who will go to bed tonight dreaming about that. But I just thought that was funny that the one time she acknowledges Mariah May is when Mariah May dresses up as Tony Storm. So Deanna baited Tony in, locked in the Fujiwara armbar early, but Tony quickly scurried to the ropes. Both ladies traded forearm shots before a lariat sent Tony outside to regroup with Luther. Deanna had enough. She hit a baseball slide. Back in the ring, Storm ran into uh, Aubrey Edwards and then hit a low blow kick on Perrazzo. So the referee was shielded. She didn't see it. She got the low blow kick, which you would think in a women's match wouldn't really make a difference, but uh, I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, t he would, uh, t Taz would call it yambag Yahtzee. There's no yambag to speak of, though. Storm kept Perrazzo grounded until Deanna just leveled her with a shot and then a series of clotheslines. Deanna connected on a flatliner for two. Tony, though, swept the leg in the corner, which led to sweet cheek music and then a spinning DDT for a close near fall. 
Tony applied the break a leg ankle lock. Perazzo fought free, sent Tony into the arms of Luther. And Deanna got two for one, hit a crossbody from the ring to the floor, wiped everybody out. Back inside, Deanna again got the Fujiwara armbar, but Luther took the referee, and Tony started tapping out. Her, her hand was flapping. She was tapping, right? If you see the flapping, you know they're tapping. Referee didn't see it, because the referee's back is turned. And Mariah May appeared and distracted Deanna long enough for Tony to hit Storm Zero, and she picked up the win. And when the match was over, Tony celebrated with Mariah, handed her the AEW Women's title, which, if you, if you watch, Mariah May was uh, briefly staring at that championship. And Tony left the ring. So Tony Storm hands Deanna Perazzo her first loss here in AEW. Now, Deanna had at least one match in AEW a long time ago, before she was signed. So it may not have technically been her first loss, but it's her first loss since she signed to become an AEW star. Uh, but it was decent. I mean, this was the weakest thing on the entire main card. Not, not counting zero hour. This is the weakest thing on the entire show. Uh, I was actually disappointed in this match. I was expecting more. Uh, the best part of this, honestly, the best part of the entire match happened before the bell rang. But the best part of the entire match was that Mariah May entrance. <laughs> I'm still like, I still can't get over how identical she looked to Tony Storm. Uh, but like I said in my predictions, of the names that I see potentially taking that women's world title from Tony Storm, Deanna Perazzo is not one of those names. Mariah May, as their story continues, is at the top of that list. And the other name I could potentially see is Jamie Hayter. And they need to get her back as soon as possible so we can... She can start her climb back into title contention. I, I'm, I mean, it's nice that we're getting Pac back. But I'm waiting for that return, or that return vignette for Jamie Hayter. And then we came to what I figured there's no way this match could be topped. And in some ways it wasn't, in other ways it was, because I love the main event. But I'll put this match up against most matches that will end up on this year's Match of the Year list. Will Ospreay, in his first official AEW match, one-on-one -on -one with Kanosuke Takeshita. Both members of the Don Callis family. So Callis came out. He did commentary for this match. This and the main event were the two matches I was most looking forward to on this show. And I said earlier, I said if I had to pick one match that would be the show stealer, and I, I was only limited to one, it would be this. And at the very least, it tied with the main event. Otherwise, it was the show stealer here. Just because these two, you, you ring the bell, put these two in the ring together. You know, they came in with very high expectations. I had very high expectations for this match. And somehow they managed to surpass these expectations. So the crowd was very loudly behind Will Ospreay. You watch his entrance when he came out there. First of all, Elevated is such a great fucking song. But again, just like in, uh, were they in Huntsville, right? They were in Huntsville the other week. He comes out here in Greensboro and gets a superstar reaction. That's why I say it's not going to take very long for him to become the top babyface in this company. He's already halfway there. So they're loudly in Osprey's camp right from the very start. And he hit a lightning quick Hurricane Rana. Takeshita responded with a Takeshita line. He cut off Osprey in the ropes and hit a delayed superplex for a one count. Uh, stiff chops from Osprey that led to Pip Pip Cheerio. And a corkscrew kick to catch the roll to the floor. You can't get away from this guy just by rolling to the floor, though. And Osprey met him with a slingshot dive. Back inside, we got the Kawada kicks from Osprey. To catch the, though, fought back with a running boot. And a somersault dive of his own out to the floor. Anything you can do, I can do better. Back inside, to catch the wanted a top rope senton. Osprey got the knees up, buried them right in this guy's spine. Osprey hit an enziguri. Takeshita answered with a German suplex, and he charged, but as he charged, he ran right into a standing Spanish fly, and we got a double down. Both men traded forearms until Osprey hit a hook kick, and that crumbled Takeshita in a heap. Osprey connected on a rolling elbow. Bryce Remsburg checked on Takeshita. These uh, forearm shots, th these rolling elbows and these forearm shots, that these fucking guys were doling out. Um, Again, they're very good at what they do. 
So they're very good at making it look good and making it sound even better. So the shots they were throwing looked like they were just knocking each other silly. And Takeshita's selling here, I thought, was excellent. Because he crumbles down, and he's got that faraway kind of starry look in his eye, and the referee is coming over asking him, are you okay? Can you continue? I'm going to call the match. And Takeshita kind of shoves him off. And he was you know, selling it like he was concussed, but he wasn't you know, going into convulsions like Brian Danielson has done before, which is ridiculous. But, you know, selling it clearly like he was just not all there. But he rose to his feet and he demolished Osprey. He gave it right back to him. Multiple forearms. Osprey tried for more Kawada kicks, but Takeshita swung for the fences and then Osprey collapsed. We got a series of counters and hook kicks and that led to a... Tiger suplex for two. And then Will Ospreay, he signaled for an os cutter, and he tried a, a few different times for an os cutter in this match. He signaled for one, he went for an os cutter, he springboarded off the ropes, and Takeshita catches him in midair and spins him around into a blue thunder bomb. A fucking great spot. That was a fantastic visual. And it got the crowd up to their feet. Multiple times during this match, these two men got this crowd up to their feet and got a standing ovation. Osprey fought off a chaos theory, hit more hook kicks, and then finally connected with an os cutter. Only got a two count. Osprey signaled for the hidden blade. Takeshita, though, struck first with a forearm, and Osprey barely got a shoulder up when Takeshita went for the pin. Osprey hit the cheeky Nando's kick. Takeshita, though, held on when Osprey tried for a corner Hurricane Rana. So he didn't go over, but Osprey crashed and burned, and then he stood up. And this is the moment in the match where I, I feared for this man's life. Not the same way that I fear for Darby Allen every time I see him, every time he breathes, but this was a very scary moment here because Takeshita pulls Osprey up from the mat, okay? Because he he's already on the ropes. So he reaches down, he pulls him up like he's picking him up in the air for a suplex. And he ends up, I think the idea here, and I, I actually don't know if the spot was designed this way on purpose or not. Because even the announcers made mention of the fact that they thought that Takeshita was going for a top rope uh, brain buster, which we've seen people do before. Pick the guy up and you drop him head first on the top turnbuckle. Well, if that's what he was going for, he didn't hit it. And instead, he went for this uh, avalanche brain buster on the turnbuckle, but. I mean, it just destroyed Osprey's back on the way down. He connected on his back. He took a just a hellaciously nasty bump. And then they zoomed in on his lower back. And you could see all the bruising on the lower part of his back. Just, an, just a scary, just brutal spot. Takeshita hit the charging knee strike. Osprey managed to kick out. And Takeshita took too long for another knee. Osprey blocked it into a stun dog millionaire and then hit a poison Rana. Takeshita spun out of a Stormbreaker into a Crunchy and a Wheelbarrow German, but Osprey exploded back up and hit the Hidden Blade only for Takeshita to kick out at one. One. And everybody lost their minds. Both men hit dueling rolling elbows. Takeshita, though, ran through Osprey with a Lariat. Osprey blocked a jumping knee strike into a Styles Clash. Only got two. And then Osprey broke out the Tiger Driver 91 that he almost killed Kenny Omega with at Forbidden Door. Uh, this one was only marginally less lethal. And then he hit the Hidden Blade and finally put Takeshita away after 20 minutes of an absolute instant classic. Uh, when the match was over, Don Callis celebrated with Osprey before checking on Takeshita and they showed Kyle Fletcher. Uh, who I believe is the current Ring of Honor television champion, and also affiliated with the Don Callis family. I guess he's a member. Here comes Kyle Fletcher down to the ring. Osprey and Takeshita, they showed respect to each other. And then Osprey and Fletcher, they had a brief face-off before they embraced and they hugged. Excalibur told us that he was just informed, I'm sure by Tony Khan, uh, that the match for Dynamite on Wednesday is going to be, well, Osprey one-on-one -on -one against Kyle Fletcher. There is your future face, 
of AEW. You saw him in the ring tonight. His first official full-time match on the AEW roster for Will Ospreay. Welcome to AEW, Will Ospreay. Make yourself at home. Enjoy your stay. I know I will if I keep getting matches like the one we got tonight. This match was fucking fantastic. I said I had high hopes for this match coming in, and somehow they exceeded my expectations. If I had anything to nitpick, I would have cut out some of the near falls, uh, because they went near fall crazy near the end. But honestly, in this, in this match, it didn't even bother me. Some matches it bothers me, some matches it doesn't. I love this match. The crowd loved this match. They gave it a standing ovation. During the match, they gave it a standing ovation when it was over. I could hear the announcers giving them a standing ovation when it was over. Uh, Tony Khan has in Will Ospreay somebody that he can build this company around. And he has that in Takeshita as well. But I think as far as like the face of the company, if you want to think of somebody as the face of the AEW brand, MJF, right, for the entirety of last year, was like the face of AEW. Will Ospreay can be that as a babyface for Tony Khan. He has not only the in-ring ability, it speaks for itself. I mean, so does Takeshita. Takeshita is fantastic. But Ospreay just has that charisma about him that Takeshita doesn't, not, not in the same way. Uh, you can build around this guy. Whatever he signed him for, I'm sure Will Ospreay, I think he got Barry Bloom as his agent when he became a free agent. I'm sure he made out very well. Uh, but whatever Tony Khan is paying him probably isn't enough. It's a huge pickup for him uh, because he's going to be able to go out there. He's going to be able to work with anybody. He's going to be able to elevate their game as much as anything else, no matter how good they are, right? I mean, he's a special talent. And anybody who has followed his career through New Japan over the last several years, you knew that already. I mean, you knew it if you didn't know much about this guy. If you just saw his match with Kenny Omega last year, the second one, you knew it, let alone the first one at the uh, Tokyo Dome last January. This man goes out there, and when the bell rings, he can do things that are just spectacular. Uh, and he can do all sorts of impressive things. But there's a charisma there with him that I think will also uh, serve him very well as a babyface. Even though right now he's still affiliated with the Callis family. I don't expect that to last much longer. Uh, because now he's facing a second member of the Callis family, right? This was the first one. Now he's wrestling Kyle Fletcher on Wednesday. I'm assuming there'll be a match that comes with Will Hobbs. Right? Maybe that's going to be the big business match in Boston. Maybe it's going to be Hobbs and Osprey uh, on that show. But this is how you begin your run in a new company, by going out there and having a match like this. Uh, there was no dissension evident tonight within the ranks of the family, but there will be very soon. But I can't say enough good things about this match. This, this was just unbelievable. And certainly up to this point in the show, and even now that the show is over, if it wasn't the match of the night, it will share those honors with the main event. Uh, this was five stars all the way, you know, all the stars in the world. I loved it. Fucking great. Then we had Samoa Joe defending the AEW World Championship in a triple threat match against Hangman Adam Page and Swerve Strickland. Jim Ross joined on commentary. And I wasn't sure if JR it's was going to make the it. Amazing Goonthar. You know, Goonthar made it. Jerry Lawler loves wasn't Goonthar, sure about JR. Magnificent. All hail Goonthar. Hey, Aaron is dropping another $50 Goonthar, not, not, uh, not Gunther, Goonthar bomb on me. How many of you still remember the story behind Goonthar and how that came about? Uh, Aaron, man, thank you. You're on fire tonight. Thank you very much. But we have the, oh, so, uh, apparently, was that announced that Jay White is wrestling Darby Allen at Big Business? That's a hell of a match. How, how is Darby going to wrestle after the beating he took tonight? He's got glass embedded all over his back. He's climbing Everest in April. Between that and what he did tonight, I'm convinced that this man has a death wish. But yes, he is climbing the mountain. He's doing it. So he's not going to be around much longer. I mean, in, in AEW. Hopefully not the other way. Well, let's talk about this uh, three-way for the AEW world title. Jim Ross joined on commentary. He had surgery on, was it a broken hip? I think it might've been a broken hip. And he's had cancer issues as well, skin cancer. So he's been through the ringer. 
And I know he really wanted to be there tonight, you know, in Greensboro, working with Tony Schiavone. So I'm glad he was able to make it. I thought he did a good job on commentary for the last two matches. Uh, Swerve came out with Nana. They did, you know, he did the dance. Then they had some backup dancers. Joe ran wild right out of the gate. And uh, he even did the classic Samoa Joe sidestep maneuver. And uh, followed that by laying out Swerve with the tope. And then he cut Paige off from doing a follow-up dive of his own. Joe got low bridge to the floor, and Hangman hit a fallaway slam on Swerve. Both men kept up at the same... Well, actually, Hangman kept up, and then Swerve kept up. And Swerve connected on a head scissors and a follow-up uppercut, turned his attention to Joe, and he delivered an uppercut off the apron. Joe broke up the uh, Page and Swerve uh, scuffle with running corner boots to each, uh, and a high... Actually, a, a boot to Page, and he had a power bomb into an STF and then a cross-face transition. Swerve broke things up. He started a forearm battle with Joe, which is a very bad idea. Joe won that. For the record, do not begin a striking exchange or a forearm exchange with Samoa Joe because it will not end well for you. Swerve avoided a muscle buster and superplex before head a headbutt crumbled him to the floor. Joe took uh, a little too long to follow up. And that led to a double team power bomb from Swerve and Page. And uh, they had a stare down after this. Because again, Hangman is like Psycho Cowboy right now. He is obsessed with making sure that Swerve does not become the AEW World Champion. That was the story coming into this match. He was more determined than anything else, even winning the title himself, to make sure that this man did not walk out the World Champion. And so every time they came face to face, I mean, he had this look, this crazed look in his eye because he's psychotic now. He's completely obsessed. Strickland, by the way, he got uh, like a mouse, I guess, under his eye. He was bleeding from right under the eye. So he probably had a shiner. It was tough to tell. But we had Swerve, booted Joe to the floor, Hangman moonsaulted out of the corner into a tombstone on Strickland, only got a two count out of it. And uh, that got broken up by Joe. Page avoided an STO and cracked Joe with a big boot. Swerve countered a Deadeye attempt into a powerbomb with a stack. Uh, Strickland let Joe connect with a muscle buster on Hangman, which gave him time to hit the Swerve stomp and a house call on Joe. And instead of covering Joe, Swerve set his sights on Hangman Page. And he hit a house call. Page, though, kicked out. Joe got up. Got some Kawada kicks on Swerve. Went to the corner, but he got hung up, and Strickland hit a DDT. The 450 splash to the back hit, and Strickland followed with a Swerve stomp. Page, though, pulled the leg of the referee, and then he decked him uh, in the process. And Page grabbed the AEW World title. He leveled uh, Swerve. I think it was twice he hit him with the championship. Page connected on multiple buckshot lariats on Samoa Joe. There was no referee, though, because he took the referee out of the match. He beat him up. So now there's no referee. Finally, Bryce Remsburg hits the ring. He makes a two count. And Page went for a third buckshot. Joe, though, slapped on the coquina clutch instead. Strickland flew in with a sky twister press with everybody down. Prince Nana threw his crown to swerve. He says, here's my crown. Use my crown as a weapon, which would be legal in a three-way match, right? No disqualifications. And Swerve didn't want to do it. So again, if there's any doubt about this kind of slow-moving double turn with Swerve and Hangman, you look at the way Hangman's been behaving. Look at the way he acted in this match here tonight. Now you got Swerve refusing help, right? I mean, that's exactly what's going on here. We're getting the slow burn double turn between these two men. He goes, no, no, I don't need it. I don't need to use the crown. Meanwhile, he did need the crown because Joe sank in the coquina clutch. Swerve countered, though, into a roll-up. Page, though, broke it up by uh, beating the hell out of Bryce Remsburg. Everybody took turns delivering lariats. Page laid out Joe with a buckshot. Strickland hit one of his own on Page before hitting a JML driver. Joe popped back in, hit a half-and-half -half suplex on Swerve, dropped him right on his head. And then reapplied the coquina clutch on Hangman, and Hangman struggled for a little bit, but then he tapped out. 
and Samoa Joe retains the AEW World Championship. And on commentary, Excalibur posed the question, did Hangman Page tap out more so to prevent Swerve from winning the AEW title uh, than he did tap out because he just had nowhere to go and decided to tap out? That was the story they were trying to tell. That was the exact story. I, t I told you exactly how this match was going to go. It went exactly the way that I said. The only problem is, there's one little problem. As hard as Excalibur tried to push that theory and push that question, and I, I know that's the story that they were going for here, um, it didn't come across that way. It did not come across like he felt Swerve was on the verge of winning the title, and so he tapped out. The way it came across was he tapped out because he had nowhere to go. And Joe had him dead to rights, and so he tapped out. Swerve was on the other side of the ring. I think they went with the wrong finish as far as the, the way that they executed it. I think there were better ways to do the finish that they intended to do. You know, it could have been a situation where Swerve was actively involved in the losing fall in that he had Joe maybe in a, in a situation where, you know, Joe was in jeopardy of tapping out or something and, Hangman taps for, I mean, there were, there were so many different ways you could have done it. The way that they did it, I don't think it came across the way they intended. I think there were better ways to go about doing it. But it was the story I expected. I thought the match itself was uh, very good. Uh, not the best thing on the show, but uh, it, there were a few moments during the match where they weren't quite on the same page and things were not as, you know, solid as they probably wanted them to be. But I still thought it was a very good match. Swerve is going to get that title. Maybe it'll be a dynasty. Maybe it'll be a double or nothing uh, in Vegas. But he will be the AEW world champion. And the issues with him and Hangman Page are not going to be over. Uh, I don't think they'll be over. Look, until Swerve is the champion, unless Hangman wins the title first and then drops it to Swerve. But I don't really see the need for that. But these guys are going to be feuding for a while. right? This, this feud's going to go on. Samoa Joe's reign is going to go on. I'm very happy about that. I would have been upset if they would have taken the belt off of him tonight. Joe deserves a little bit longer as the AEW World Champion. Even if it's only two months, he deserves a little bit longer as the AEW World Champion, uh, and I'm happy that he's going to get a little more time. Now we get to the main event. Before we get to the main event, let me remind you, hit that like button if you are uh, coming in late. Let's get those likes up, see how high we can uh, run the score here. But now we get to the main event, the swan song for the icon himself, Sting and Darby Allin, undefeated coming into this match tonight, 28-0 and zero against the Young Bucks in a tornado match for the AEW World Tag Team titles. We had Jim Ross and Tony Schiavone on commentary with Excalibur, but they were on commentary tonight for Sting's final match just the way they were in Greensboro in March of 1988 when Sting challenged Ric Flair for the NWA World Heavyweight title. So how cool is that? And Ric Flair got an entrance first. He came down to the... Actually, he came down the ramp, and then they played Ricky the Dragon Steamboat's music, and he got a big reaction here in Greensboro. And out came the dragon. He and Ric Flair embraced. They walked to the ring because... Ricky Steamboat was the guest timekeeper for the match here tonight. So they came down to ringside. Flair basically just took a seat next to the announcers. He wasn't doing commentary or anything. He was just sitting right beside them. But they showed in the front row, we saw Nikita Koloff, we saw Magnum TA, and we saw Scotty Riggs. Which one of these does not fit with the rest? We had those three in the front row. Uh, I said earlier, Lex Luger was there. I don't know. I don't believe they showed him on camera, but he was in the building. I saw fan video of him being wheeled around in his wheelchair. I think DDP was there as well. Uh, Kevin Nash was not. Even though Sting invited him and wanted him to be there, Nash said he wasn't going to go. Um, so it was cool that they had some uh, some dignitaries there you know, for Sting's retirement. And I'm sure people that he wanted there, like Nikita and Luger, uh, DDP, so that was very cool. The Bucks 
made their entrance. They rose from underneath the stage. They gave them the Cody elevator. Cody left his elevator to the other EVPs. And so they rose up, and we had Matthew wearing the black robe. We had Nicholas in the white robe. Real wrestling robes. Actual, like, old-school wrestling robes they had tonight. And then we got a video. Well, Darby, uh, I think Darby came out first. And then we got a video. The final showtime. This was the special video they put together for Sting here. And now I will mention actually that on the pre-show, and I thought they were just going to re-air it here on the main show, but on the pre-show they had a different video for Sting, and it was very good. It was set to uh, a song called "The Silence" uh, by the Manchester Orchestra, which I thought was—I mean, that song choice was on point. It was a great song. Uh, I had goosebumps watching that video, and it was a lot of the same footage of him like in New Japan and whatnot that they had here in this video, but it was just, it was different. They had like two different videos for him. But check that video out if you didn't see it, Uh, or at least, you know, get get the song on Spotify because it's a great fucking song. But I thought they did a great job here of uh, weaving in the limited footage of him outside of AEW that they had. I don't know if Tony Khan reached out to TNA. I, I didn't notice any TNA footage in here. It was kind of weird. The only footage they had was him from New Japan, which makes sense because Sting did briefly wrestle a few times in New Japan. Uh, They had footage of him against Anoki. They had footage of him in there. Oh, God, who else was he in there with? Uh, Muda. They had him in there with Muda. But, um, yeah, I don't think they had TNA footage, which is kind of surprising. You know, WWE, I figured they're not going to, you know, they don't give a fuck about Sting. They barely gave a fuck about Sting when he was there. Why should they give a shit about him now? So I wasn't expecting WWE to be like, oh, sure, yeah, you can use our footage. But um, they made the most of the footage that they had access to. It was mostly just New Japan and AEW stuff. But this video here, it's called The Final Showtime. And it was an empty theater. And Sting was sitting by himself in an empty theater in one of the rows and the curtain lifted up and it was a screen. It had the Scorpion logo and then it went into all the footage of his career. And, you know, it was a very emotional thing to see because you know that this is the end and you're looking back on all of these highlights and, um, yeah, it gets to you because you realize like, wow, this is really it. And you know, you know how wrestling retirements can go, but like, I trust that this is, I think Sting realizes like, I may not get another chance to go out, the way that I want, I may get hurt again, I may get older, and I'm gonna, you know, look terrible, and so why not go out now when I still feel like I can go out on top? So I think this is definitely the end for him. But uh, when the highlights were over, the curtain came down, and Sting was sitting all alone in this empty theater, all by himself, face paint on, and the camera focused on him, and he told us, he's kind of looking around, and he goes, it's showtime. For the last time. And then he leaned into the camera and he said, let's do this. So they come back live to the arena and they're playing Sting's AEW music. And who walks out? Surfer Sting. Surfer Sting, I think it was like the red, white, and blue jacket and face paint, walks out. Surfer Sting being played by one of his sons. And then we got Wolfpack Sting with the long hair and the trench coat and the red face paint. So we have both of his sons are part of his retirement and they get to play two different incarnations of Sting from two totally different eras. How cool is that? And then it's time for the man himself and we hear Seek and Destroy by Metallica, which was his old music in WCW there for a period of time. And I know Tony Khan got the rights. I think it was at Wembley last year to use Seek and Destroy. So very appropriate that he would come out to that music. And then you get that visual of him walking out on stage. And he's got the tag team title. But it's, you know, Wolfpack Sting, AEW Sting, Surfer Sting, him and his boys on either side of him. His other boy, his adopted boy, Darby, on the ramp. The two of them hug and embrace. Uh, and it was just very, it's a very cool thing. It's a very cool moment. 
I thought this was uh, very well done. The video and the entrance and the music. Again, Tony Khan, yeah, to his credit, uh, he spared no expense and he made sure that he gave Sting the proper send-off that he deserved. But they come down to the ring and Darby hit an early suicide dive that caught everybody off guard, including the announcers. Jim Ross, <laughs> Jim Ross is like, what the hell? Because the Bucks were standing right in front of the announce desk. And so, you know, how Darby's like a bat out of hell. He launches himself out of the ring, and the Bucks collide with the announce table, and so we're off to the races, and it's a tornado match, as I think pretty much most of their matches have been, uh, Sting and Darby, so it's just total chaos, there's no tags, they're fighting all over the place. Sting and Darby hit, Stinger splashes on the Bucks in the ring, and then Sting's sons got in the ring. And we had Surfer Sting hit a Stinger splash in the corner. And then Wolfpack Sting hit a Stinger Splash in the corner. And Wolfpack Sting hit a much better Stinger Splash than Surfer Sting. So we know who the real athlete in the family is. And uh, it ain't Surfer Sting. Sting then put the Bucks in a double. He stacked them and he put them in a double Scorpion Deathlock. And they quickly escaped. So the action spilled outside. Sting's sons... I didn't know how long they were going to be involved in this match. I said, is it just basically going to be a handicap match? <laughs> you know, the Bucks are the EVPs here. Don't they have people they can call out? Where, where's their uh, fucking buddy over there, Brandon Cutler? Where's he at? Yeah. Bra Brandon Cutler is what we did not need for Sting's final match. Thankfully, we didn't see him. So they're helping their dad uh, set up some tables outside the ring. And Sting launches Nick and Matt into the crowd. Uh, back at ringside, Darby, he flew off the uh, the top rope with a coffin drop to the floor. This was before the, the Bucks ended up in the crowd. There was a ladder that got thrown into the ring. I mean, the plunder came out early here in this match. And Sting said, I think it was to Sports Illustrated, but Sting's been making the media rounds. And uh, he said that he, it was funny to me because he said, I want people to... Uh, not only remember this match, you know, I want it to be something that they that they get on tape. <laughs> like, that's how old he is. Like, old school. He's talking about tape. He still, he still thinks people got their VCRs at home. They're going to tape the pay-per-view. He wants them to tape it because he's going to give them something. He's going to give them a, a memory they'll never forget. He said he's going to wrestle a certain way that they will never forget. And so I saw the plunder coming out early, and I said, oh boy, what, is it, what has he got in mind here? Well, we found out pretty quick, because Sting reaches under the ring, and what does Sting pull out from under the ring? He pulls out a pane of glass. And I wasn't sure if it was real glass. We found out pretty quickly that it was. At least one of them was. I don't know about the other one. But he pulled out a pane of uh, real glass, Crimea River, and his sons laid it down very gently because they had set up chairs outside the ring, like parallel to each other. And they took the pane of glass and they gently laid it on top of the chairs. And I had a flashback to the match that Darby had with Jeff Hardy in the Owen Hart tournament when Darby had the ladder set up. And remember he took that ridiculous, like Jeff was laid out on the chairs and Darby did that ridiculous dive almost killed himself. I mean, you can say that about any Darby Allen match. The only difference this time is now we have a pane of glass that is laying across these chairs. And I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I hope Sting doesn't go through that pane of glass. He didn't go through that one, although he did go through glass. I don't know if the glass he went through was real, though. So Sting had a baseball bat, and he swung the bat at Nick, who dodged it, and Sting ended up breaking a different pane of glass that was kind of laying up against the uh, ring apron because they had pulled two of them out. So he shattered the glass with the baseball bat. The Bucks ran for their lives. The match spilled into the crowd. Eventually, they ended up on the stage. And Nick Jackson hit a falcon arrow to Darby off the stage through two tables down below. On the other side of the stage, we had Sting and Matt or uh, Matthew, Matthew Jackson, I guess, right? Matt raked the eyes to avoid a scorpion death drop attempt, and then he suplexed Sting off the stage, also through two tables that were down on the opposite side of the stage. So that was Sting's first big bump of the night.
The Bucks made their way back down to the ring eventually, once they regrouped. And uh, they came back down to chance of, fuck the Young Bucks. And they brought Darby all the way back to the ring. So they left Sting. Sting is being tended to over by the stage. He can, he can get a little breather. So they put Darby in the ring. It's two on one. They powerbomb Darby into a ladder that was propped up against the ropes in the corner. Darby, though, came back and answered with an over-the-top stunner on Nick and a code red on Matt. And Darby sets up a huge ladder in the ring. And by the way, the referee for this match was the Bucks' good friend, Rick Knox. So Darby sets up a ladder in the ring. Rick Knox is, you know, holding the ladder to steady it because Darby's about to do something very dumb. And what ended up happening is Darby, uh, he slammed Nick onto the uh, ring steps. And he went and climbed the ladder. He was going to do a dive out onto the Bucks or, or one of them. I think it was Nick. He does a dive, and he, I think he landed on his ass. Like, he did enough of a flip that he either almost landed on his ass or he did land on his ass. The point is, he went through, he crashed through the pane of glass that was laid across the steel chairs, and the glass just exploded. And on the replay, you can see, not only did the glass explode, now there's glass everywhere. And I fucking hate glass in wrestling matches. Like, I know they do it in like some of the extreme promotions in GCW and they have these fucking garbage matches with the glass and everything. I think it's fucking stupid. Uh, but, again, I knew they were going to do some crazy shit in this match, and so I wasn't shocked when I saw the glass. I wouldn't have been shocked if I saw thumbtacks or barbed wire. Just based on the way Sting was talking, I figured it was going to be something like this. But you could see on the replay that some of the glass... Uh, jumped up, and it looked like it hit some fans in the front, like right there by like the aisle seats over there. It probably jumped up and, and got some people in the front row. So, uh, not the smartest thing to be doing. But this fucking guy dives, he had to be 15 feet up, 12 to 15 feet up, and just crashes through the glass, and instantly now, he's face down on the ground. He is laying in a pool of glass. He's face down, his back immediately begins to bleed, right? He's all sliced up and cut up. I mean, even if it wasn't real glass, whatever it was, it cut the shit out of his back. And the blood is pouring out of it. He looks like a dead body laying there, face down on the ground. You could have did the chalk outline around this guy's body. He's out of his fucking mind. And again, this man is climbing Mount Everest in about a month. So... Now it's Sting's turn. Now that Darby is dead, rest in peace, it's time for, or pieces, it's time for Sting to make his way back down to the ring. Nick sets up a table. The Bucks were mocking Sting. They were doing his, uh, you know, the Stinger howl to mock him. And then they ended up hitting each other. There was a little uh, friendly fire between them. Sting beat down Matt. He set him up on the table. There's a table in the ring. He sets Matt down on the table. The ladder is still in the ring. It's still upright. And so Sting begins to climb the ladder. And I'm thinking, well, at least he's closer this time to the table than he was when he launched himself off the ladder in the ring out to the floor that one time and knocked some of his teeth out. If you remember that spot. At least this time it should be a clean bump. But he never got to do it uh, because Matt got up off the table and cut him off. Nick, meanwhile, set up another pane of glass in the corner, okay, in the corner of the ring. Matt powerbombs Sting off the ladder through the table, and Sting no-sold it. He got right back up, and then the Bucks grabbed him, and together they threw him, and Sting goes crashing through the pane of glass in the corner, and the glass shatters all over the mat. Eventually, they get Sting back up to his feet. Matt delivers a low blow and then hits a scorpion death drop. And again, there's glass. There's shards of glass all over the ring, little pieces. Uh, scorpion death drop to Sting. At least Sting was wearing a long sleeve t-shirt and gloves. Darby had no shirt on. So, of course, Darby got this, his shit all cut up. Sting at least has a long sleeve shirt on. Uh, Sting kicks out. 
Nick goes to grab the tag team title belt, one of them from Ricky Steamboat. Or he went to go grab the belt. Steamboat, though, stopped him. And he ended up getting knocked out by Matt. Ric Flair. Here we go. Ric Flair climbs into the ring. Slowly, but he climbs into the ring and he crawls over, over the glass. He crawls over to Sting in the corner and he is shielding Sting. Remember how Lita shielded Matt Hardy when Steve Austin was going nuts right after he turned heel in 2001, the two-man power trip, wrestled the Hardy Boys, and Lita ends up covering Matt, her boyfriend. Don't hurt him. Don't hurt him. And so what did Steve Austin do, right? He beat the fuck out of her with the chair, right? You'll never see that replayed again. So now Ric Flair is shielding Sting, and he's, he's telling the Bucks, enough, you know, stop, enough, enough. And... He's trying to shield this man from any further elder abuse. Now, Flair, speaking of elder abuse, is on his knees, and the Bucks do the double super kick to Ric Flair. And Flair now is all laid out, unconscious, in the pile of glass in the corner. Steamboat ended up getting decked. I think he got super kicked. Matt blasted Sting with the tag team title belt, and again, Sting kicked out. So the Bucks hit a double super kick on Sting, who no sold it again. This is one of my favorite parts of the entire night, actually. They hit, I think it was the double super kick spot where Sting, he was upright, and it knocked him backwards, but he stayed on his feet and he slowly came back forward. And the people were losing their minds. And Sting had this look on, like it was perfect. Like he sold this perfectly. Like the way they constructed this match. Yeah, again, I could hate certain parts of it with the glass and stuff like that, but like the way they put the match together and they structured it was pitch perfect because it was all designed to get Sting over. This was not about getting Darby over. This was not about making the Young Bucks look good. This entire night, this entire match, this entire promotion up to, up to this event was all to make Sting look as good as possible on his way out. And so the crowd now is going nuts and... He delivered a double lariat to the Bucks, turned him inside out. Scorpion death drop on Matt. Only got two. Because at this point, I'm still thinking Sting's losing. So, you know, they got me on some of the near falls, but then when the Bucks kept kicking out, I'm like, all right, well, it's because they're, they're going to go over in the end. Uh, and I wish they wouldn't. I wish Sting would win because it's going to take the air out of the building, but I figured, you know, he's going to want to go out and lose the belts. So Sting goes for another Scorpion Death Drop. Matt, though, rolls through. And the Bucks hit the EVP trigger. This is where I thought it was over. They hit the EVP trigger. Sting kicks out again. The Bucks shook Sting's hand and tell him, oh, it's a pleasure doing business with you. And they hit a second EVP trigger. Sting this time kicks out at one. This fucking guy kicked out at one. Again, people losing their minds. Sting looks up at them. He's tell he's like smiling. He's telling them to bring it. And he eats a super kick and the Bucks. Now they want a Tony Khan driver. Poor Dave. It's no longer the Meltzer driver. It's been renamed. Now it's the TK driver. So they want to go for the TK driver. Darby, though, is back. He's back from the dead. This entire time, by the way, he was laying face down in that same position that he was when he crashed through the glass. So now Darby flies back in. He shoves Nick, who is on the top rope. He shoves him off the ropes. And Nick takes this huge bump through a table outside the ring. The table explodes, shatters upon impact. So now Nick is out of the picture. Sting hits a scorpion death drop to Matt. Only gets two. Darby leaps off the top rope with his, bo his back is all cut up. They put tape on his back. I guess while he was out there, the, the doctor or the trainer came over and they put tape on his back. But he flies off anyway, all bloodied with the coffin drop to Matt. And then Sting sinks in one last scorpion deathlock. And he turns Matt over. And Matt struggles for a little bit. And then Matt Jackson taps out and the building explodes. The perfect finish for the perfect send-off for one of the all-time greats. You could not have booked this any better. You had some cameos in there. Sting's sons got to be involved, which made sense because they were beaten up by the Young Bucks on TV a few weeks ago. So that was their retribution.
That was that was their way of getting revenge on the Bucks. And then they disappeared. We never saw his sons again after that. So it's not like they, you know, stuck around for the entire thing. They had their moment at the beginning and then they vanished. Uh, Flair had his moment in the match. Obviously, he and Sting are just, they're linked for life. So it made sense for him to be there. Steamboat, always good to see Ricky Steamboat. Uh, I'm still amazed that he took the abuse he did in there with the uh, leather strap when they did the angle with him and Ricky Starks last summer. So Steamboat can still go. Uh, so Steamboat got involved here for a little bit. Uh, Darby did his usual stuff. Sting got to shine. The Bucks, I look, I mean, everything about this was as perfect as you could ask for, including the people who were worried that the Bucks were going to win. They didn't. And so Sting not only wins in his retirement match, but he gets to retire undefeated as a champion. And he may no longer officially be the champion because from what I saw, apparently they uh, have been stripped, I believe. And they may be having a tournament now to crown new tag team champ, which is what I figured they would do. Uh, but he gets to go out as a champion. Now, Sting's family, his other family members are shown in the front row when the match is over. Uh, confetti is raining down. Darby gets on the mic and he says, we only have three minutes left in the show. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> you have three minutes and you're rushing off the air. Did Tony Khan not prepare for this? Did Tony Khan not go, look, can we get an extra 10 or 15 minutes of transmission time here? Right? I mean, he's paying for Seek and Destroy by Metallica, but he can't pay for an extra 10 minutes of pay-per-view time. Did he not know that this event was going to go long? He's the one who put the card together. He's the one who timed out all the matches. How could he not know? Come on. So Darby says they got three minutes left. He said three minutes. I thought a couple of heavy Samoans were going to run out and beat them up. So he goes, show some love for the Stinger. And everybody shows love for Sting. And Sting takes the mic and he thanks Greensboro. He said that he's been thanking the fans really since March of 1988. And he brought up the 45-minute draw in this very building between him and Ric Flair. He thanked Rick. He goes, I don't know where Rick is. Is Rick still here? I don't, I don't know where Flair went. But he thanked Ric Flair. Sting said he wanted this to be a night that wrestling fans would never forget. They cut to a shot uh, briefly of a guy in the crowd who was crying. Uh, I don't know if he knew he was on camera, but there he was. He was and I'll, I'll bet you anything he wasn't the only one crying. There were a lot of fans, I'm sure, watching from the comfort of their own home, not on camera, who were crying as well as they watched uh, Sting's farewell. Sting said he wanted it to be a night of wrestling that was etched in people's minds for years to come. And he said that it was him who was saying that it was a night that he would never forget. He thanked Darby, called Darby the greatest tag team partner that he has ever had. And he wondered, he looked at his back, and he wondered how many stitches Darby was going to need to uh, close up that wound in his back. Darby took the mic and said that, he once said that he would die in Sting's final match, but he said, I'm still breathing. Sting said, he was a risk taker. You know, Darby's a risk taker. He goes, I was a risk taker in my younger years. And he goes, I'm an old man now, but I'm still a risk taker. And Darby then went over to Sting, and he whispered something in his ear. And then Sting kind of laughed and told the crowd, well, I got to wait because I'm getting, I'm getting cues. And that was when they put the copyright notice on the bottom of the screen. And the show faded to black. So, yes, they cut Sting off in the middle of his retirement speech after his last. And I'm sure it's already up on YouTube by now. Uh, but still, like, how are you going to cut Sting off during his retirement speech? Again, I, I don't know how they didn't plan for this. I just, you could have cut a match off the show. I mean, this was all about Sting. You had to leave time for that moment at the very end. So we got part of the moment. You know, Our parting shot was of Sting, at least, with a smile on his face. He laughed at Darby's, whatever Darby said, he smiled. That was the parting shot. So at least we got that image. Um, I don't believe that you will see a better send-off for a wrestler than the one that Sting got here on this Revolution show. This was pitch perfect. Um, I got to give praise to the Young Bucks. They went in there and they did business. And they turned out to be the perfect opponents for Sting. They got a ton of heat in Greensboro. The people chanting, you know, fuck the Bucks. Right? You knew they were going to get heat in that building. Anybody would have, you know, against Sting in his final match. But the Bucks are just extra douchey 
So they were the perfect foils for Sting and Darby in this match. And they were bumping around like crazy for him. And then in the end, you had Matt tapping out to Sting. So they didn't even have the Bucks go over here. They had Sting, and, which again, I love the fact that Sting and Darby got to go out as winners, uh, undefeated in their final match. And I can't say enough good things about what they did here. It was really, in, in many ways, it was the storybook ending for uh, someone's career who didn't look like he was going to have that send-off that he wanted. And the fact that Tony Khan allowed him to pick his opponent and to pretty much do whatever he wanted and to put his you know, own retirement together and write his own final chapter in the way that he wanted it to be written uh, is fantastic. And I'm glad there was another company that, you know, afforded him the opportunity and the outlet to be able to do that. Because this company didn't even exist when he got hurt in WWE. Now, when he got hurt in that match with Seth Rollins and it looked like his career was over, AEW wasn't even a fucking thing. Like, if you would have said AEW, you go, what's that? The hell does that mean? So the fact that there was another company that happened to be on the Turner Networks, right, which Sting called home for many years, and you had Tony Schiavone and you had Jim Ross in that very building where he wrestled Ric Flair in you know, one of the most famous matches of his career. You couldn't have written a better ending for this guy. And uh, I'm very, very happy that uh, everything went the way it did. He looked like he was fine. He didn't get hurt. I was a little worried about that, what he might do. Uh, he didn't do anything overly crazy. Darby did. Sting didn't do anything terribly crazy. And uh, this was excellent. This will go down as one of the matches of the year. This and the Will Ospreay match were the two highlights uh, of the pay-per-view, the two main highlights of what overall I thought was a very good pay-per-view. Uh, the women's title match was the weakest thing on the entire main card. And even that wasn't bad. It was just kind of disappointing and, and you know kind of flat with the finish they did. Uh, but there was nothing bad on the show. You know, Really, the matches on this show, I would say, range from good to great. And if I had one final uh, parting message here at the end, I think it'll be the same message that is being spread all over social media, right? The hashtag that's going around, it's very simple. Thank you, Sting. I think it's appropriate. There really is nothing else to say other than thank you, Sting, and, you know, the last of a dying breed. It's too bad, you know? There, there aren't very many left like him that uh, go 40 years and span all the different companies that he worked in. It's, it's pretty incredible when you look at the career that he had from the NWA to WCW to TNA for all those years, brief time in WWE, at least he got that WrestleMania match, and now in AEW for four years. All the people he got to work with, from Flair and the Horsemen to Muda to Vader, Luger, and Hogan. I mean, we can forget about Hogan, I guess. that I'd rather forget about that match they had. Uh, but, you know, all the people, even in TNA, Kurt Angle and AJ Styles and, you know, the, the WrestleMania match he had with Triple H, and it's, it's pretty amazing. So let's take a look at the Twitter poll, see what you guys thought about this pay-per-view here. 75% give this show four stars which is the highest rating that we could give here in this Twitter poll. 15% give it three stars, 4% give it two stars, and 5.6% give this pay-per-view one star. So a very positive score for Revolution. Very good pay-per-view. Sting and Rick Rude. That's right, I forgot to mention Rick Rude. They, uh... Of course, the most notable match they probably had is the one where Rick Rude got hurt. And that was the end of Rick Rude's career. That was a match in Japan. He was wrestling Sting when he took that horrible bump on his lower back. They had that elevated platform and right at the edge of that platform, his back. And that was the beginning of the end for his in-ring career. Oh man, 90% three stars and above. Yeah, you combine the four stars and the three stars, 90%. I mean, people people seem very happy with this show. Um, I don't see why they wouldn't be. I would say you got your money's worth, except for uh, some people maybe who didn't see part of the pay-per-view because of Bleacher Report. Fuck Bleacher Report, by the way. Alright, let's get to your Super Chats. 
Let's get to your super chats here. Again, I'm just checking to make sure that they are all uh, showing in this column. We've been having that issue where some of the early ones don't show up on that list on the... Uh, yeah. All right, there's some early ones that we will uh, get to those right now, actually. Let's do those first. So these are the ones that you're not going to see on your screen. Uh, hey, uh, Winston Slip, thank you for the super chat. He says, uh, buy or sell war games or elimination chamber matches. Uh, I'm a war games guy. So war games. Uh, Booba. Anyone else hear JR call Garrett Borden Stinger Splash A plus size Stinger Splash? Nah, I did not hear that. I don't know which one was Garrett and which one was, uh, I think, is, is Steve? Is it Steve Jr. is the other one? I don't know what the other one is, but whoever was Wolfpack's thing, that son, did a much better Stinger Splash. Joey with the uh, five. Watched up to the international title match on my phone at work. Gotta go home and watch the rest now. Kingston against Danielson was awesome. Yeah, there were a ton of uh, great matches up and down the card. That's why I thought it was a, an excellent show overall. Had some great wrestling on the show. You had all the insanity of Sting's final match. Yeah, you had a little bit of everything. Linklex. Sting said, No one's ever attacked my family before. Kirk Angle, am I a joke to you? <laughs> All jokes aside, congrats and thank you, Sting. A true icon. Uh, Andre Israel says, thank you, Sting, and fuck Bleacher Report. Absolutely. HBKC83, Darby is not of this world. Pure insanity he is. Yeah, he's uh, he's not all there. Royal World. Legit thought Darby was going to die. Holy crap. Edwin Garcia says AEW has too many titty titties. <laughs> you put an extra T in there. And then the L, you got me confused. AEW has too many titles. You can never have too many titties. AEW has too many titles. Or tittles is what he technically wrote. Even though you can't see it on screen. He misspelled it. Uh, the Juliet says, I don't ever want to see Darby that uh, Darby do that bump again. Yeah, I, I really don't either. And uh, Gary Cause Chuck. What's going on, Gary? Got my missus to watch her first AEW show tonight during the Osprey match. She says, this is way better than anything we have watched so far. Smart girl. <laughs> She's got good taste. She has got good taste in wrestling. All right, now. Now we can catch up here with Anderson Blitz. Says, now I know why GG split from Darby after seeing the spot. Also, hashtag thank you Sting for being a part of my grandpa, grandpa, dad's, mine, and my brother's wrestling love. Yeah, again, it's it's amazing the, the generations that he has spanned. And he could probably go another year if he wanted. Like, it's not even like he looks horrible when he's out there. And the guy turns 65 in a few weeks, right? He, he can collect social security right now if he wants to. He could be doing AARP commercials. The guy is, he's an anomaly. It's just, it's not supposed to work that way. Edwin, it's all good. Autocorrect strikes again. It always does. Jazz Jackrabbit, first saw Sting in my 92 PWI Top 500, ranked at number one. I was confused and did not get it because I was a WWF fan. 32 years later, yes, one of the all-time greats. He really is. And I talked about him on the show earlier, and I said, you know, when people talk about their Mount Rushmores, you rarely hear Sting's name brought up. So it's kind of like an odd thing where he is an all-time great, and maybe if you had a top 10 or a top 15, he might be in your list. But he's not, like, talked about the way that someone like a Hogan would be, or even a Flair, uh, or an Austin. He wasn't influential in the way those guys were. Uh, not that he didn't influence people, he did, but he was not influential nearly as much as, like, the top names of the industry. But he had the longevity that very few people have. And he did it across multiple promotions. And he held titles in every single promotion. Every single promotion I mentioned before that he has been in, he has been a champion. 
I mean, how many people can say that? How many people can say they held NWA, WCW, WWE? Well, he didn't hold titles there, but NWA, WCW, TNA, and AEW titles. Like, how many people can say that? Is there anybody else who can say that? <laughs> I mean, maybe. Maybe there's one. I mean, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, hey, the Winston Slip. Dropping some more love. Uh, we'll get to him in a second here. Isaiah Duzon. Takeshita against Osprey was my match of the night. Uh, had a fun time. Definitely worth the almost 400 miles we traveled. Hashtag thank you, Stain. Oh, making the trip. Yeah, but you know what? To be in the building tonight, like, that crowd, that was special. So, if you were in the building for the show, then I'm sure it was well worth it to make that drive. That had to be fun. Being in a packed building like that, staying one last time. Like, those are the moments that make it worth it. Domination Warrior was at the show. Hot crowd. Joe is king. Real glass. Well, it was real enough to uh, cut the shit out of Darby. I can't say it was all real, but whatever it was, it uh, fucked up Darby pretty good. Bobbert Reviews dropping 15 bucks. Bobbert, thank you. Cameron Johnson with the 10. Best wrestling show I have ever been to. Crowd was hot all night. Only fitting to end the night with the Sala Monster. I'm just happy I ended up being able to watch the damn show. For a while there, I thought I was going to have to wait until tomorrow. Uh, the Moldy Cheeseburger. He's a man called Sting. A man called Sting. He's the man called Sting. The man called Sting. He does this. He does that. That's right. He's also quick as a cat. And don't you dare cross him or get in his way. Because if you do, you're going to have to pay. To the man called Sting. Oz and Glorious. Sorry, dude, my Sala Monster sent me sign got confiscated because the other side was bad-mouthing Disco Garcia. Show was epic nonetheless. Very disappointing. I forgive you. K-Dog's Kennel. Thank you and good mic work for the amazing collaboration stream. I can't put one above the other. You both are 1 and 1A one as far as best podcaster. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. That is up on his channel right now. We collaborated talking, uh, ranking all of the Bret Hart matches at WrestleMania. Since he's doing WrestleMania-themed stuff on his channel, he thought, you'd be the perfect person to talk about Bret Hart. I said, how'd you know? How did you know? Uh, Saquon just got back home from the show. Osprey is a fucking beast. What a show. Osprey is fantastic. Osprey's great. Bender McSimpson, small detail. Matt Jackson spent months selling a back injury, and he was the one to tap out to the Scorpion Deathlock. That's true. I forgot about that. That is true. Uh, Bender also says the last three matches of the show were great. What do I got to do to get Osprey against Jay White? Uh, just wait a few months. You'll probably end up getting it. <laughs> you know, I don't think you're going to have to wait very long. Uh, Prince Gitta, Tony Khan just vacated the AEW Tag Team titles at the Scrum. Tournament begins soon. A Tony Khan specialty, of course. We're going to get a tournament for our new Tag Team Champions. I mean, it's what makes the most sense. The Bucks will probably still end up with them. I have a feeling we'll, we'll end up right back where we would have been anyway. Aaron, with the $50 Super Chat, says, Does Swerve win the world title at all in? I think he wins the world title before that. Uh, it's possible. It could happen at all in. Well, you know what? If they're going to hold off on Osprey, let's say, for next year. Because I don't think Osprey has to win the world title this year. I, I don't think you need to rush into it. I guess they might want to do something big in the main event of All In. Do a world title change there. I still think he probably gets it no later than double or nothing. And he defends it. Maybe he walks into Wembley defending it. So that would be my guess. 
Daniel Manuel. I have not been able to watch anything AEW for months, but has John Moxley looked this skinny for a while? He looked noticeably skinny today. Uh, I've noticed that he's been skinnier, but I just, you know, I mean, he, he looks a lot better than he did when he was drinking. I look at him now and he looks healthy to me. You go back and look at John Moxley a couple of years ago and how bloated he looked. I don't think there's anything wrong with the way he looks. I think he looks fine. Uh, Aaron with another $50 bomb. Aaron again. Thank you, man. He says, so glad Sting got the main event and got his send-off. Everything about that match was beautiful. Is Sting top five of all time? To me, he is. What do you think? Uh, I don't. I don't have him in top five of all time. Uh, but if I were to sit here and think about a top 10 or, you know, a, a top 15, maybe, maybe even a top 10, uh, he might crack the list, but... Not top five. I mean, again, that kind of goes to the whole Mount Rushmore thing and why you don't hear his name mentioned on most people's Mount Rushmores. Mount Rushmore is four, uh, but you don't really hear his name mentioned. Top five, top five, I, I don't see it. Top ten, possibly, yes. Bender, Darby against Jay White at Big Business. Let's go. Uh, is that official? Because that's a pretty damn good match if that's official. Hoffenheim. Solo, you could have connected your phone with the TV if you wanted to watch it on TV. Uh, except that I can't because there's one little problem. I, with my setup the way it is, I have to be here to take notes. See, if I was able to watch the pay-per-view like a normal person, then I would watch it on, on TV and it wouldn't be an issue. Um... But because I need the setup here the way it is, so I can take notes during the show, because AEW, of course, has 15,000 matches, then I'm kind of limited to where I need I, I can be for these shows. That's the one thing. People were, like, tweeting me going, well, why don't you just connect it to this, or watch it on the TV here, or do this, or do that. I go, you can do that. I can't do that. Michael Darcy, underrated part of the match was the Bucks saying, we're not sorry, we hate you, before super kicking Sting. I thought they were great. I thought the Bucks were great. I thought they were fantastic. And you'll get the usual haters because there are people that don't like them, which is fine. But I think that even people who don't like them, if you're being objective about it, you know, they were the perfect foil for Sting in this match. They were the perfect punching bags for him. And I think they did a great job. Chris Mike Sell says, does Flair manage Darby or can he go away? I think he can go away. Uh, he's, he's not going to go away because he has a, a longer term deal with the company. I don't think that necessarily means he has to be on TV. Darby does not need Ric Flair as his manager. Dar Darby is going away too because he's going to be climbing a mountain soon. He, I, think, I think they said that the uh, Everest climb is like a two month thing. So, I think Darby will be disappearing very soon, and hopefully all goes well, and he'll actually come back. And if he does, it probably won't be until June or July. Darth Panic. I'm not sure if you covered this topic already, but according to Fightful, Tony Khan reached out to Martha Hart and got her approval for Sting to come down from the rafters. Thank you, Sting. Yes. I uh, t tweeted about that the other day, and I talked about it on the podcast. It's a very uh, class move on his part. I didn't have to do it, but it was the right thing to do. Because they do business together, and it's obviously a very sensitive thing for her family. And so it was, you know, a very classy, appropriate move, I think. Just the whether he asks for permission or just says, look, we're doing this, and I just want to give you a heads up and make sure you're comfortable. Either way, it's just a matter of common courtesy. Uh, Barry says, I still remember when I got you to review that Sting against Abyss match that had a dumb finish, and you were so shocked that Sting would take a thumbtack bump. I'll tell you what, man. Sting is, is one of those guys, he is not afraid to try new shit. Whether it's a thumbtack bump, whether it's a balcony dive... I, I give him a lot of credit. That He does not have to be doing that kind of stuff. He chose to do it because he felt like 
I don't know why he chose to do it. He obviously felt like he either wanted to because it would be fun, or he just felt like he had something to prove. I don't know. Sting, Sting has always come across to me, and the way people talk about him that have worked with him, like just the coolest guy in the room. You know, the easiest guy to work with, never a problem, never a headache. Like so many of these top guys that you hear about, big egos, and they're so concerned about how am I going to look and what's the finish and I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, I can't look weak. Sting don't give a fuck because you know why? You know why? Because he's smart. He's smart enough to realize that he's a made man and no matter what happens, he's still fucking Sting and the fans aren't going to love him any less. Winston says, Sting's coolest outfit. Sting's coolest outfit? I, I still am partial to Surfer Sting from back in the day. But having said that, his coolest look? His coolest look. It would have to be that original Crow. Like that 97 Crow look. That was probably him at his coolest. Surfer Sting is still my favorite Sting. Linklex, it's crazy to think from the original NES to the PS5 slash Switch, Sting has been in at least one video game per generation of consoles. Impact Sona was at the show live. Crowd was hot for everything. First time I got to be part of the Judas sing-along, and it was epic. I now love Osprey's work. There's going to be a lot of people who have not seen much or any of Will Ospreay who are going to have their eyes open to what he can do. Now that he has a national platform on weekly television, I think he's going to win over a lot of new fans. Tuxedo T. Sur yeah, Surfer Sting also had his best matches. It's part of the reason why I like Surfer Sting the most. Uh, his, his, his peak as far as his matches go... Really, his peak was the late 80s, early 90s. And I, I said this earlier. I would say through maybe 93. That was the peak for Sting, as far as his in-ring work and his matches. Because uh, that's really where his greatest matches were from. His greatest matches were with Vader. But you had the Vader matches, you had the, the Cactus Jack match at Beach Blast, you had the Ric Flair matches... Uh, if you wanted to expand it out to Rick Rude, right now you're getting into 93, 94. That really was the peak, you know, in ring for Sting. Not that he didn't have any good matches later on. They just weren't as good as the ones he had back then. Part of that also were the quality of the opponents that he had to work with. But his series with Vader is still his best series of matches. Like, I love those matches even more than the matches he had with Flair. Those Sting and Vader matches were fucking great. Uh, Tuxedo T. Servo. Sting was super candid at the Media Scrum. Recommend a watch. After this, of course. Yes, after this. Yeah, I will watch it tomorrow. I actually have to go to the mechanic. I have to wake up at 6.30, so... What time is it now? 2.40? <laughs> Great. Uh, Brian Keith. Just got back from the show. This definitely was a history-making moment to see Sting's final match. The last time I saw something this awesome was Dusty beating Flair for the world title at the Great American Bash in 86. Yeah, again, if you were in attendance at the show tonight now, you've got a, a lasting memory. You got to see... It's like when I was at WrestleMania in Orlando, and Undertaker had that terrible fucking match with Roman Reigns. Like, honestly, that match was the opposite of what this match was. And I thought that might be it for The Undertaker. When he took the robe off and, you know, the hat and everything, he left his his gear in the ring. I thought we were watching the final appearance, the retirement of The Undertaker. And it was a sad moment, especially coming off a sad match. But I was like, well, this is cool, you know, that I get to be here for this. Like, in the stadium, and it was 12.15 in the morning, and the show was still on. But like, okay, this is it for The Undertaker. And he stood in the ramp, and then they lowered him into the ground and the plume of smoke. And then he just came back the following year. <laughs> he just came back like it didn't even happen. It's like, all right, you took away from me what should have been a memorable moment. You ruined it, but that's okay. JP, 
Use VPN with Fight, cheaper and better quality too. You may have to. Uh, Aaron says, buy or sell Cross Thing or the OG Undertaker? Hmm. That's an interesting one. That actually would have been an interesting match. That could be like a uh, Be the Booker match. Cross Thing or the original Undertaker? Like the Grey Glove Undertaker. I love Grey Glove Undertaker. Ah, man, you know, ah, it's tough. It's tough. I probably would go with uh, Crow's Thing, though. I think Crow's Thing was cooler. Steven J. Neptune Man. Sting Invader set the blueprint for all big guy, little guy matches to follow, and if Star K97 went off smoothly, it would be the best example of a good buildup and good payoff in wrestling history. Uh, it would be one of them. I think that... I don't know. The, the Hogan and Savage thing is, is pretty high up on the list, though. You know, And their WrestleMania match did big business. And they built that thing up for a while. They built that thing up for about a year and a half. Almost as long as they built up Sting and, and Hogan. And we got a better payoff out of it. So... Got to show some love to that one. Hey, M. Mills, thank you for the $10. Very much appreciated. Nick Grasso, Will Ospreay is the real deal match of the night. One match I need is Ospreay against Danielson. That match would tear the house down. Yeah, some people are saying they wanted it uh, all in, and I think it would be great. I still think, I think we're going to get Danielson and Nigel McGuinness on that show. But it's not like Danielson is retiring in August. I mean, he's, he's not going to be full-time anymore. So you could still do Danielson and Ospreay at some point. It just doesn't have to be this year necessarily. And Boney, is Peacock better than Bleacher Report? Yes. Yes, it is. I don't even have to think about that. Peacock is better than Bleacher Report. Then, now, and forever. It's the easiest question I'll get all night. Thank you for all the super chats. So, yeah, check to make sure I didn't miss anybody here. Uh, I did not set a goal tonight for Be the Booker because I knew you guys would kill it anyway. Uh, we have over 600 likes, so thank you for that. Uh, please uh, keep hitting that thumbs up, especially on your way out. But before, let's uh, go ahead and do a revolution-style Be the Booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to Be the Booker. There he is, the man himself. The Stinger. Wouldn't it be appropriate if we landed on Sting tonight in Men's Be the Booker? I think that would be very appropriate. Well, let's begin here with some tag team Be the Booker. We just book some random matches if you're new here. That's what we do. That's really all there is to it. We take it for a spin and we see what we land on. We never have any idea what we're going to land on here. So, for example, we land on these two fuckers. Well done. If you're asking yourselves, who the hell are well done? You're not the only one. Timothy Well and Stephen Dunn. And don't ask me which is which because I couldn't tell you. They had a very brief, uneventful run in the WWF in the mid-90s. Well done. How do you like your steak cooked? Well done. Well done against Cody Rhodes and Jay Uso. <laughs> Not even Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso can save that match. And so we move on. Maybe we'll have better luck here. Women's Be the Booker, we begin with, well, so much for that. <laughs> hmm. It's... Ariane, everybody, the one who would uh, go on to great fame as one of the Funkadactyls, Cameron. But this moment lives in infamy here from Tough Enough when she was addressing Stone Cold Steve Austin, who asked her, what's your favorite match? 
And her response was, my favorite match was with Melina and Alicia Fox. And Steve Austin's response was, who? <laughs> A moment that will live forever. Oh, man. We are not doing well with Be The Booker tonight. No, we are not. We may have a hat trick, like a reverse hat trick tonight. Come on, man. We need Sting. It's Sting's final match. This could be Sting's final match right here. That's not Sting, but that's Sami Zayn. The honorary Oos, Sami Zayn. Give me Sami Zayn against Sting. The match we never got. Maybe we could still do it. Maybe we could still pull it off. Should probably spin it. I'm staring. I'm staring at Sami Zayn. I forgot to hit the button. The American Badass Undertaker against Sami Zayn. That would have been a jobber match back in uh, 2000. He would have annihilated Sami Zayn. It would have been like a superstars match. But I like the match. I think Undertaker and Sa I think Sami Zayn is one of those workers who could have given Undertaker one of his better matches. But this was not a good night for Be The Booker. No, it was not. Well, they can't all be winners now, can they? At least we got one. Devin from NJ says, Who is Solo's favorite wrestler to sound off about? Uh, Hulk Hogan. Every time he lies and the bullshit flows, I just find it supremely entertaining. And people seem to laugh and get a kick out of it because it's just the most, it's just a babbling brick of bullshit. And he always is giving me new material. So I'll say Hulk Hogan. And we got a super chat coming in here from our boy Aaron, who's not done yet. He's not done yet. He's got a super chat coming in any minute now. It says Crow Sting was the coolest character in wrestling history. I may be biased because I have a tattoo of Brandon Lee as the Crow. But with that said, Crow Sting set the tone for cool but dark characters in wrestling Sting forever. Crow Sting was badass, man. You know, coming down from the rafters with the baseball bat, the, the face paint on, he had the long hair. Uh, just single-handedly beating up the NWO every single week. Sometimes he wouldn't even need the bat, you know? He would drop the bat and just beat them all up anyway, right? He was the, he was the coolest. You have a Brandon Lee Crow tattoo? That's actually pretty cool. Anyway, Aaron, thank you as your creepy Jeff Hardy. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for the super chat. And thank you for uh, staying up late with me. It's almost 3 o'clock in the morning, but... Uh, very, very good pay-per-view, very strong pay-per-view. Will Ospreay and Takeshita absolutely tore the house down, but Sting stole the show because it was all about Sting. It's final time in the ring, and I think that uh, you could not have asked for a better send-off. So thank you to him, and thank you to all of you. If you missed episode 851 of The Sound Off, it'll be waiting for you in the morning. Make sure you... Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast from. Over two hours, a lot of good stuff in there. And then I'm going to be live with you in less than 24 hours because we got to talk about Monday Night Raw. See what Cody Rhodes has to say about what The Rock said. When The Rock told Cody, fuck your story. We'll see if Cody has any response to that. Be well. Stay safe. And uh, we'll do it all over again Monday night after Raw. Come on back. Until then, thank you, Sting.